Brothers and sisters, welcome to Orchid Presbyterian Church. On this cold morning, we pray that the warmth of the love of God will embrace you and be with you. And we pray that you will sense some of that as we bring our worship this morning. And we thank God for this opportunity to be together, even if it is virtually. We are not bound by time or place, but in the bonds of the blood of Christ and in the communion of the Holy Spirit. And so God, may God be glorified in our worship today as we entrust all things into his hands. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this morning and for this time together, and we pray that you will be glorified in this worship. We pray that we will be able to rise above our circumstances, whatever they may be, and may be brought into your presence there to see your glory and to find the joy that comes from walking with you. And so, Lord, in the music, in the proclamation of the word, in all things today, be glorified and work for your good purpose in our lives. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. Please join me in the call to worship, which comes to us this morning from Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. So the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults, Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be a blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Yours is the glory, 
Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we come to a time of prayer now, and I want to share with you today several things that have been happening in the lives of some of our people. First of all, I want to announce that two people who have connections to our congregation have passed away within the last week or so, and we want to be remembering their families today. We want to be in prayer for the family of Mary Allington, for her husband Bob, with whom she was married for 64 years, for their children and grandchildren. They had a deep and abiding love for each other, 
And that's felt throughout that family. And so we pray for God's comfort for them now in Mary's passing. Also acknowledging that we are a resurrection people and we believe in the life to come. And we also affirm that for Sue Janke's mother-in-law, Betty. And she has had a wonderful, another long life, lived in faith and trust in Christ. And now comfort for her son, Dr. Eric, and for all those who are grieving in this time And we thank God that we are a people who are allowed to grieve, and that's okay. We feel the pain of that separation, and yet Scripture says we do not need to grieve as those who have no hope. So we thank God for the hope that is always ours in Christ. We also want to be in prayer today for those who continue to struggle with the COVID virus. There are several in our congregation who are battling it right now, but there's two that I would like us just to be aware of, particularly this morning, because They're struggling with it uh, to the degree that they both had to be hospitalized. And so today, I want us to continue in prayer for Lydia, who's the mother of Tony, Shady, and Daniel Escobedo, as she is in Marion Hospital on a ventilator, and just prayers for her. And then prayers also for Pearl Garza, and for her family, for her husband, uh, Mark, and for her sister, Vero Oropesa, and for all the family who is concerned for her in this time, and she is also in the hospital and on oxygen. Now, we need to thank God because the great majority of the people we've been praying for with COVID have come through and are doing well now. But at the same time, we need to hold fast in prayer for those who continue to struggle and pray that God will deliver them from this affliction, and we'll do that again today. We also want to be in prayer for those who are dealing with other afflictions, I'd like us to be in prayer for Dick Barrett of our congregation. Dick was scheduled to have a back procedure down in Santa Barbara on Friday, and that got canceled. Uh, He's been in tremendous pain in his back for many weeks now, and so prayers for him as he has to experience the frustration of that postponement and as he waits for its rescheduling. And so we pray for God's grace, and we pray that the time will be short until he can have that much-needed procedure. And you know, we are in a season where there are many, many great needs, but at the same time, I think we need to stop and thank God for the good things in our lives. And I want to thank God for his goodness in the lives of at least two of our people who I know who've successfully gotten through the COVID and were back at work this past week, our secretary, Cindy Baeza, and one of our elders, Kelly Blair. And we rejoice in God's goodness to them. And also, Kelly had an additional blessing in that her daughter, Amanda, announced her engagement She's going to be married in late April in Montana, where she serves in the United States Air Force. And so we rejoice as life goes on and good things happen. And we continue to trust that God will continue to watch over us, whatever we're experiencing in our lives now. Believing that, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for your presence with us. And we thank you that you are the God who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's true, Lord. That's true every day of our lives here. And it's true, Lord, even when our lives here end. We thank you that we are a resurrection people and that our hope is because Christ is risen, we also shall rise and we shall live in him. And we pray that that hope will be strong in the hearts of the Allington family and of the Janke family as they mourn these whom they have loved so dearly. And we pray, Lord, for those who are still here, who have to go on without those whom they love so much. And we pray that you will be the God who gives the comfort and the grace that is needed every day and every night. And we ask, God, that you will make yourself known even in the midst of a time of grief. We pray, Lord, blessing over all those who are struggling with the COVID virus, not just in our country, but around the world, Lord. And we pray for those, particularly in our congregation. We thank you for those who have recovered. Praise to you for Cindy and Kelly and all those who are doing better. And we pray that these who are still struggling will experience your deliverance, your saving power in the midst of this. We pray for Lydia, and we pray for Pearl, and we pray that even today, Lord, there will be a turning for the better. We pray for the clearing of their respiratory systems. We pray that they will be able to breathe on their own without machines and without oxygen. We pray that you will restore that which has been damaged, and we ask blessing and strength for them. 
And we pray comfort for all who love them and can't see them but are thinking about them every moment. Lord, be near. Be near and bless, we pray. And we thank you, God, for your goodness to us. And we pray that you will continue to bless all those, Lord, who are are struggling with whatever their affliction might be. We pray for Dick Barrett, grateful that some of the procedures that he's had have gone well in recent weeks, but this is the big one, Lord, the one he's been waiting on with his back. So please, Lord, speed the day when that's possible. And we pray in the meantime, Grace, that he'll be able to sleep, that he'll be able to experience a freedom from pain in his days and in his nights. And this gift, we pray for him. And we thank you, God, for the good gifts of our lives that we may just take for granted and that we don't think about in times where things pile up and and our lives seem to be so full of burdens. We thank you, God, that in the midst of all that the Blair family has been through, that you've provided this wonderful good news of their daughter, Amanda, being engaged. And we pray a blessing over her and her fiancé as they prepare to marry. And we thank you, God, that this is a marriage not just of two people who very much love one another, but two people who know you and love you. And so we pray, Lord, that from even these earliest days, you will establish a lifelong and deep bond that is sealed by your spirit. It is blessing that we pray over these, trusting them and all who are on our hearts and minds into your care and remembering the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Good morning. Happy Sunday. I am so glad that you are here joining us for another virtual service. So recently I was speaking with one of the girls from the ministry and she was sharing with me how difficult it has been for her to not feel like she is truly a part of the church family right now and how the loss of the programming has impacted her. And I shared with her that it's really important to remember that we are not the author of this adventure called life. God is, and he truly is in control, even in the times when we don't understand. So we continued our conversation and we discussed things that the Lord so freely provided in the ministry last year at this time in January. And we talked about our Lego camp our KFC group that would meet every week, the Joyful Noise Children's Choir, our nursery ministry, our weekly Kids Connection classes, which is our Sunday school programming. The children were able to serve at our one church meal wearing their adorable tuxedo shirts and their bow ties. We were preparing to leave for winter camp at Forest Home. And we had our M&M movie night and our tutoring center was going. Now that is a lot of things in a four week period to have removed from all of you. But please kids know that there is hope and there will be a breakthrough and God is with us and he will continue to be. In fact, if you open up your Bible to Matthew 28 verse 20, it reads, surely I am with you always to the very end of age. During a pandemic, Jesus is saying that God is with us always, no matter what. So enjoy this video and take a look at what Jesus went through in his life and his message of how God is truly with us, that promise. Stories of the Bible. God is with us. This is Jesus. hey Jesus is the Savior of the world and the Son of God. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, 
and even raised people from the dead. Uh, wahoo! But some people did not like what Jesus was doing. And they put him to death. He died on a cross and was buried in a tomb. For three days, Jesus' body laid in that tomb, and it seemed that there was no hope. But very early on Sunday morning, the woman who cared for Jesus went to go visit his body, found that his tomb was empty and that he was no longer there. Ah! For he was risen. He was alive. Woohoo! Huh? Hey, oh! Ah! And then for the next 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples and many others and showed them that he was alive and well. <laughs> he taught them that what he did was the only way that they could be forgiven and be with God forever. Jesus told his disciples that he did all the things that God had told everyone that he would do, and the disciples understood what he was saying. Yep, that makes sense. He told them that he would send the Holy Spirit, just as God had promised to be their helper. Sounds good. After Jesus had spent 40 days with the disciples and appeared to many people, hey, that's it. He led the disciples to a place called Bethany. Jesus blessed the disciples and told them to go out and tell the whole world about him and the good news of forgiveness and make disciples of them. Then he said, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Then Jesus was taken into heaven to sit at the right hand of God. Not long after that, the Holy Spirit did come to the disciples to be their helper. The disciples knew that God would truly be with them always. And the Holy Spirit is still with us today, for Jesus promised that he would be with us to the end of the age, and he is. What an encouraging and inspiring message of hope that God is truly with us always. And sometimes the Lord says things to us that are so simple and we forget how important they are, such as God is with us. So kids, I want to promise you that God is up to something. He is doing something right now in our lives. And I pray that you trust that and that you lean on him and be in his word every single day. And I'm telling you, I will see you soon. God bless you. Thank you, Jen. We now come to the time in our service where we receive the morning offering. And although we're not here passing baskets in the sanctuary or out on the lawn, Right now, this is our chance to participate in the ongoing work that God does through this church, not just in this community, but even around the world. We all know that we live in a time of great needs, and I'm so thankful to God that we can continue to partner with him, uh, because that's how God's decided to do it. Sometimes I don't understand why God chose to do it that way, but he did. He chose to do his work through us, through people like us, and it's as we all share in that work together that it gets done. And so I invite you to consider uh, supporting the ministry of this church at this time. And there's different ways that you can give. Uh, you can mail your contribution to our church at the address that's on your screen there. Or you can give online at our website. That address is there for you as well. Or there's a phone number where you can text to give. We encourage you to consider God's blessings in your life and to respond as you are able. And let our giving, as always, be an act of real worship.
me now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so, so much for your goodness. We thank you for your provision, Lord, um, in, tides, in times of need, in times of plenty. Lord, and as Jen just shared and reminded us of all those beautiful ministries, just, just, just a sprinkle of what goes on here at this church. Lord, I just thank you for the privilege of partnering with OPC to bring these wonderful programs about for not just the children, Lord, but for so many of those that call Orchid Presbyterian their home. Thank you for throughout this past year of, of the pandemic that you have just had your people be so faithful, Lord. I thank you so much for that partnership and I pray that we would continue to partner with this church, Lord, to see your kingdom come. Thank you so much for all of your blessings. And would you bless and continue to bless this church and all of the good, good things that happen in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And now let's prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that it's a word that is just as relevant now as the day when it was first written and received. And we pray that we will receive it now by the power of your Holy Spirit, and that you will ignite that word in us to be fruitful in our lives for your glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, Pastor Israel gave a great introduction to the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. Of all the letters that Paul wrote to churches, this church seems to have been the most healthy. Not that it was perfect. There were some issues there, as we'll hear later. But for the most part, this church evidenced a living and growing faith. And for that, Paul rejoiced. It was obvious to him that these people were becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Let's remember the circumstances around this letter. Paul had founded the church at Philippi a decade or so earlier on one of his missionary journeys. It was one of the first churches in what we today call Europe. And now Paul is in prison, probably in Rome or Ephesus. It is the church at Philippi who sends one of their own, a man named Epaphroditus, to come and find Paul and to encourage him through not just a personal visit, but also a financial gift from the church to help meet his needs. And Paul is encouraged. The visit of Epaphroditus witnesses to how the love of God is at work through this congregation, which has consistently supported Paul over the years. Their prayers and financial support have been a source of joy for him. So much so that Paul can say at the beginning of the letter, I thank my God every time I remember you and I always pray with joy for you. Today we're going to hear what Paul prays for this church. And let's begin right where we left off last week. In chapter 1, verse 6, hear God's word. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul is confident of a good future for this church. Because it is already obvious that God is at work in and through them. And there is more to come. He knows that. There's always more to come in the Christian faith. We never arrive at our destination here. We are rather on a lifelong journey in which we begin to learn a pattern of faith and life that continues into eternity. And we are not alone on that journey, ever. It is God who is at work in us by his spirit for his good. And that purpose is that we would become more and more like the Lord Jesus. Jesus showed us how to live. He showed what a turned toward God existence looks like. 
His example is one we are expected to follow. That will happen when we want to follow and commit ourselves to the lifestyle of following Jesus, drawing on the power of God's Spirit who lives within us. Brothers and sisters, spiritual growth is the expected outcome of the Christian life. God is at work in us constantly and will be until the day of Christ Jesus, meaning the day when Jesus returns in glory and we see him face to face. Until that day, we are on a journey. We are in a process. And perhaps the best word we can give to that process is salvation. Salvation has two deliberate dimensions in Scripture. It is both an accomplished fact due to the promise and action of God and also a process which we are engaged in every day of our lives. And you can see both of those dimensions in Paul's letters. Let's look quickly at his letter to his colleague Titus. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Now here in these verses, salvation is an accomplished fact. It is something God did for us when he sent our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. We have been saved not because we were good people, but because God is good and extends mercy to sinners. Paul tells us through faith in Christ we are reborn or born again into a new relationship with God. This moment inaugurates a new life for us, a life characterized by renewal by the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit who begins to renew us into the image of Jesus himself. Far too many Christians see faith as a static thing. I believed in Jesus, I was saved, and now I sit around and pretty much live for myself as I wait to go to heaven. That is a travesty of faith. Faith is a living thing. It is not something we had once. It is something we have every day and choose to live by. That is God's design. Renewal by the Holy Spirit is a lifelong process. It is an everyday reality we embrace as we bring our lives before God in prayer, seeking to follow and glorify him. And that is why Scripture doesn't just say that we were saved, but that also we are being saved. Listen to this from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Here the power of the cross assures us of God's love and saving grace in Jesus Christ. It is the power of God for our salvation. But salvation is an ongoing experience of ours by the Holy Spirit as we are renewed into the image of Jesus. Do you know that? Is that how we live? The problem that I think many of us have is that we have pragmatic. Their faith was a living, growing thing. Paul knew that because he experienced it in their great gift of Epaphroditus being sent and traveling many miles to encourage him and bring a gift to help meet his needs. That was a source of great joy to Paul. And you can see that as we go back to Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, Since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection 
of Christ Jesus. You can sense the deep affection Paul has for all these believers here in these verses. Their relationship is not superficial or passing. It is a consistent, faithful, and deep relationship. They are living out the reality of truly being brothers and sisters, a family of faith. We live in a time where our culture is experiencing more and more fractured families. This is tragic in many ways. Increasingly, people cannot understand the wonderful sense of security, belonging, and support that comes from a stable and loving family. In, fa- in healthy families, family is not just where you come from, it is who you are. It is a pillar of your identity, and it is always with you at some level. And I think that is what Paul experienced with the Philippians. Their connection was always there, which is why he can say, I have you in my heart. This is not an expression of sentimentality on his part. It is rather a psychological reality, a sense of ongoing presence even when they are physically apart from each other. Paul sensed the supportive network of Philippians of the Philippians all the time. And that was especially important now when he was in chains, literally chained to a guard all the time. Paul knew there would be a trial and that trial would give him another opportunity to defend and confirm the gospel as he had on many occasions. But right now he was chained up and that could have been extremely discouraging. And yet... As you read Philippians, he had great joy in his life. Joy because he knew he was not alone. The Lord was with him by the Holy Spirit, and also some of the Lord's people were with him. He knew the Philippians were constantly thinking about him and praying for him. The Philippians demonstrated that they were with Paul all the way, whatever happened. And he had the security of their support. And that gave him strength as they shared in God's grace together. Brothers and sisters, is this our experience of Christian fellowship? Do we have a strong and prevailing sense that we are indeed brothers and sisters in faith who are, who are with us and for us no matter what? If not, we are falling short of what God intends. Now, rather than give in to discouragement, let us instead look around for ways we can be there for our brothers and sisters in faith, ways that we can build networks of support for others. What a strange period of time we're living through now, 11 months into this time of coronavirus restrictions. But in this time, the idea of building those networks of support and encouraging each other could be accomplished by doing something as simple as picking up the phone and making a call or sending a card or an email or a text to let someone know you're thinking about them now. And you are praying for them. That is not hard to do. The primary thing needed is the willingness to extend yourself, to look beyond and around you, to do for others as the Philippians did for Paul. Ask God, who can I help today? How can I express your love and concern for someone else? I believe if you will ask God that sincerely, he will put people on your heart and mind for you to contact. Continuing in Philippians 1, verses 9 through 11. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best 
and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is Paul's prayer for the Philippians. This family of believers who have been so important to him, he prays that they will continue to grow in faith. What does that look like? Well, look at the details of Paul's prayer here. In a truly Christian community, the first concern must always be love. By Jesus' own words, that is to be the mark of his people. Let's go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This command, given the night before Jesus went to the cross, is both challenge and goal. To love one another as Jesus loved his disciples. Now think about that for a moment. Have you read the Gospels? The disciples of Jesus were not then and today are not now perfect people. Many of them have rough edges. Some of them don't act very lovingly sometimes. But that does not change Jesus' command at all. You know, sometimes when I read the Gospels, I think one of the real miracles of Jesus is how he put up with his disciples instead of dismissing them and trying to find a more virtuous group. But that's not what Jesus did and not what he calls us to do. We are called to love one another. But if we're going to do that, we have to know what love really is. We assume we know but I believe we often make a mistake. Too often in our culture, love is merely a feeling, a sense of warmth or attraction we have for someone else. And when that warmth or attraction lessens or even disappears, we think we are off the hook because we don't love that person anymore. The scripture says that is shallow, immature, and false. Love may or may not be accompanied by certain feelings, but love is not a feeling. Love is an action. Love is a choice, a decision. And we can see that in how God loved us. And that's very clearly defined for us in Scripture. 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. This is love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's not that we loved God, nor that we were especially lovable. Rather, love is seen in what God has done for us, in his decision to send his son that we might be forgiven our sins and reconciled to God. This is what real love is all about. It's not about looking at someone and saying, how do I feel about that person today? Rather, it is our decision to act in ways that are loving toward that person, which may require sacrifice on our part. Love isn't about making me feel better. It is about actually making someone else's life better through my actions toward them. And that is the connection that John makes here in these verses. Because God has shown us what love is in his actions toward us, we are now to act in a similar way toward others. And that sometimes isn't easy. But it is the way of love. And when people start acting that way toward one another, something amazing happens in that community. Love becomes a way of life, and people really do begin to build each other up. And this is Paul's prayer for the Philippians. 
that they as a church will continue to become a community of love more and more. I don't have time here to unpack everything in this prayer of Paul. But I do want to point out that in these verses, Paul sees three things. Knowledge of God, moral discernment, and holiness as the results of a community of faith that is growing in love. All those things are important. But what I want to focus on right now is the part of Paul's prayer where he prays that the Philippians will be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Part of the wonderful gift of our salvation is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is, God credits the righteousness of Christ to us, or to put it another way, chooses to look at us through the lens of Jesus himself. That's an important part of what Scripture means when it says that we are a people who are in Christ. But there's a further implication of this. As the scholar Gordon Fee writes, the gift of Christ's righteousness means we are to live a life of righteousness, which means we must commit ourselves to becoming more like Christ. One of the primary images Scripture uses to illustrate this is the idea of bearing fruit. Jesus talked about this himself. John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 8, Jesus says, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Here Jesus tells his followers that bearing fruit is what being his disciples is all about. And that fruit in our lives is how we glorify God. Now in today's scripture, Paul says the same thing to the Philippians. He prays that they will bear fruit and that through this, God will be glorified in them. And while Paul specifically mentions the fruit of righteousness here in Philippians 1, he talks about other examples of fruit that honors God in another letter. Listen to these words from the letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All these things are fruit that glorifies God. And please see here in these verses that the word fruit is singular, not plural, All these things are manifestations of a single reality. That reality is salvation. Through Jesus Christ, God has made the way for us to be in right relationship to him for all eternity. That is an accomplished fact. But it is also a reality to be continually lived out in our right relationships with one another in the family of God. As we demonstrate love, forbearance, kindness, faithfulness, and self control in our life together, we glorify God. And, brothers and sisters, that's what our purpose is, to glorify God. So may God be glorified in us as we continue to grow in faith every day, confident that God is at work in us for this very purpose. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, we pray that your word will now be fruitful in our lives. We've heard, now by your spirit, may we understand and apply. We pray that love, joy, peace, kindness, 
gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, righteousness, and all the other tremendous things that you want to do in us by your Spirit because of what you have done for us in Christ. We pray that that will happen. We surrender to you. We place ourselves at your disposal. Steer our lives, Lord. Bring to our minds and hearts what it is that you want us to do, how it is you want us to live, whose life you want us to bless even today. We pray that you will lead us in the path of faithful servants. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now, let's sing together one of the great hymns of the faith, Be Thou My Vision. And so, brothers and sisters, as we conclude this time of worship, let us be with thankful hearts, for we have received the great gift of salvation. And may that salvation continue God's good work in us today as we respond to the promptings of his Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the living presence of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you today and forever. Amen. God bless you.